out of northern northern california after going missing in 2016 for more than two weeks 18 year old kirk kimberly was found dead on the campus of sonoma state university it took investigators more than four years to make an arrest now one of kimberly's friends is getting ready to stand trial all kinds of little certificates for him Using her phone, Jennifer Kimberly shows off the wall she created in her son's bedroom with artwork and photos. Kirk Kimberly was just 18 when he was murdered in Northern California in 2016. The last time Jennifer saw her son was the morning of October 17th. He left on his bike to go meet a friend. I sent him a text around three o'clock asking him, just touching bases and he didn't respond and then I sent him one at five o'clock and he didn't respond and then when my husband came home I told my husband I was worried because he didn't respond the next day flyers were posted asking for help to find Kirk his bicycle and a portable speaker he carried with him we knew he could be identified to look for the bicycle and the speaker that, that I knew those were items that he had with him Two and a half weeks later, Kirk's body was found in a shallow grave on the campus of Sonoma State University. It's located near a blackberry thicket. It is relatively difficult to get to that area if you're not looking for it. Johnny Kearns is a private investigator and author who wrote a book on this case, which for more than two years remained unsolved. It was a really tricky investigation. I interviewed over 50 people who were involved in Kirk's life, from ex-girlfriends to best friends to people he went to school with. And each of them had different pieces of the puzzle that they could give to me. And it really wasn't until about uh, six months before I completed the book where I had the ability to see the whole picture. In his book released last year, Kearns named 19-year-old Daniel Carrillo as a prime suspect. Carrillo was arrested and charged with Kirk's murder. He came to my house, I fed him lunch. He played video games with my son here. Carrillo was one of Kirk's friends. This is a photo of the two of them skateboarding with a group shortly before Kirk's murder. What's unclear is why Carrillo would kill his friend. This did not happen after a protracted fight. This happened quickly, and I believe Kirk was set up and didn't see it coming. Kirk's bike and speaker have never been found. Daniel Carrillo has pled not guilty. Investigators say cell phone evidence puts Carrillo at the scene of the murder. News that only adds to Jennifer's loss. I want him to know that it wasn't his choice. It, he didn't have a right to take someone else's life. I'm forever heartbroken. I'll never be the same. Kirk was, gave me purpose and meaning. He was my contribution to the world. And, and Kirk didn't get a second chance. I wish, I wish I could have saved him. With us now to talk about this case from Long Beach, California, civil rights attorney, Joseph Flo. Joseph, thanks for joining us tonight. This is a case that, um, you know, it's heartbreaking. You listen to mom um, talk about the loss of her son and, and, and realizing that the now the person who is standing um, uh, on these murder charges was part of his son's, her son's life and was, you know, in her home and all of that. A lot of time went by, though, between the time that Kirk was found and this arrest was made four years. This is not a case. That, and Daniel Carrillo says he didn't do it. Um, there are some some holes in this case moving forward for prosecutors. Uh, what's your take on the strength of this case and the inherent issues with that amount of time between murder and arrest? That's a um, great question because from what I've read, there isn't a whole lot to go on. So for example, there's no DNA evidence. Now DNA evidence can really help out with either you know isolating one suspect or proving that they were there or that their blood was left there at that time. They don't have anything like that. Supposedly the water washed it away. There's no hair, there's nothing. So that's why they had to go to the cell phone records to see if they could put them in the proximity at the time. But I'll tell you what I think is a bigger problem for the government no one's talking about. And that would be that you have this person who interviewed all of these folks, 50 some people, and he is not on the investigative team of the district attorney or the local law enforcement authorities. 
So now he claims he interviews all these people and he writes this book and he does it for the purpose of selling that book to make money. So a good criminal defense lawyer is going to make a lot of hay with that argument saying that this is all a manufactured investigation by someone looking to tell a story and in order to tell a good story, you got to have a villain. And so we exaggerate it and here it is. The, it, that's, the, uh, that's a problem. The one thing that investigators do have going for them is that they were disgusted by the fact that he was writing a book and he was putting his nose in the investigation. Even the family had real reservations about it, um, especially Kirk's father. The, but how do, you, how do you make that point come across effectively in front of a jury? Because to your point, it muddies the water. It does, and without specificity or, or certain facts, uh, I'd just be um, generalizing right now, but I think I can say it this way. What you're going to find is there are going to be contradictions between what the witnesses say in the book or by this person and what they've said to law enforcement. That drives law enforcement in mad because now a good witness normally has something to be what they call impeached on because of some other statement that somebody else claims that they took. So with that many witness statements, you're going to have contradictions, which is only going to help the defense out. And there's more. They're, the government has more problems I'll get into if you want me to. Well, uh, you, one thing the government has, is you mentioned the cell phone records, because now jurors are very attuned to it. They get it. Oh, guy whose cell phone, what was he doing there? And they, they, they seem to take as gospel this technology um, more than they did two years ago, five years ago, even um, you know a year ago. It is evolving because they have it in their own lives. Isn't that effective? It can be, but Ted, remember, this is his friend. His friend lives in the same area. They may have even seen each other that day playing. So to have his friend in the general area, that's not good enough. They've got a long ways to go before they can say he must have killed him. And here are some other things that have got a real problem with. Keep in mind that supposedly at the time, this um, uh, Daniel Carrillo was only 16 years old and pretty small. In fact, they're saying that he's so small and demure compared to Kirk Kimberly, who was 18, two years older and bigger, that he couldn't have got that done. Well, why isn't the defense probably going to argue that Daniel was attacked by Kurt and that maybe it was a you know drug deal gone wrong and this big boy decided to bully up on Daniel a little bit and Daniel had to you know, do his best he could to try and save his life. But then after he, he knifed him, he was terrified that no one would believe him and so didn't know what to do and somebody else buried the body, which they had some evidence to support. All right, well, How it are is, they going to prove that's not true? It's a fascinating case. To your point, there are a lot of things that the government is going to be um, saddled with at, uh, when yeah. this does come to trial. Um, Joseph Lowe, thank you so much for your insight. As always, it's uh, right on point. The case, it's on the docket. We're watching it here at Court TV. You'll see it when it goes to trial. Right now, uh, there is a